So a second angel appears. And he's flying at the same place in that sequence. And he says things. Can we look at what he's saying? Verse 8, Revelation 14, he says, A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So we must later come back and ask, Who is Babylon? Who is Babylon? We must come back later and have a whole sermon on Babylon. Could it be that he's talking about the, the rebellion that happened in the book of Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve fell and then in Genesis 11 the tower of Babel could he be talking about Babylon now that is a place of idol worship and rebellion the symbol of it, the Baghdad of that time and then coming and taking the children of God into captivity that kind of heedlessness atheism and idol worship all systems against God is that the reference? All systems that work against God. And if we look at this generation, isn't it true that all the systems of man right now are against God? Everything God they are against. If the Lord says don't kill, they are ratifying and legislating abortion, legalizing. If the Lord says homosexuality is sin, they are legalizing it. Wow! What a generation. What This generation, what is the issue? What is your problem? If the Lord says, don't take undue profits from what a widow, what? They are doing it. Don't take the widow's land, they are doing it. Everything the Lord has said they shouldn't do. Don't lie, they are lying, it's no more. Even the church calls it the white lies. So, the second angel is flying in the same position and announcing that fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. First of all, who is Babylon? We will need to know who Babylon is. Number two, what does he mean she's fallen? What, what does it mean that Babylon has fallen? And why is he saying Babylon the great? Number three, why is he raising that caution on Babylon? Because he's shouting, he's shouting to the people of the earth whom the first angel has commanded to obey God, to obey the gospel. He's now raising a warning about someone called Babylon and telling them, no, don't rely on that one, has fallen. In other words, he's now talking about separation. Separate yourself from the moral decay of this world, the immoralities of this world, the prostitution, fornication, the name it, the pornographies of this earth, the lies. Separate yourself from it, the sexual lust of this world. Are we together? This is serious. Are we now together? The second angel flies by, fly past with a warning, say, say, parade out, don't trust Babylon. Don't trust the systems of this world. They are against God, they are fallen, they are posted. For them they are fallen, you separate from them. You just live a Christian life, just obey what? The first angel. Just obey the command of the first angel. What? Wow. This is serious, right? Very serious. Yeah. As we move on. And then, as we move on, a third angel appears. Can we just finish with the second angel first? Verse 8, he says, A second angel followed by, meaning within the same sequence, same altitude, same mid-heaven, right? And said, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great! I said we would have to understand who is Babylon and why is she being called the great? And by the word she's fallen, she's fallen. What has she done? What does her falling mean? Which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries, maddening wine of her fornications. She has a wine. This Babylon has a wine. Ah. And he's saying, that the wine of lunacy, 
the maddening wine, the wine of madness, that when you drink, you are mad. The, the, and, and he's saying that all the, did somebody see the word all? All the nations, not some, all. This Babylon must be moving with power, right? That must be countered in some way or the other. Because he says, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adultery, of her fornication. Meaning, she made them drink. She made them. She came to them and did something and they drank. So, what does it mean, the wine, the wine of Babylon? And what does it mean, the maddening wine, the wine that draws them into lunacy? In other words, it's saying, that that wine, when they drink it, they are, they, they are drunk. They are out of control. The way a drunkard is drunk, and they don't know what they are doing. They have now been. They, they, now they don't know what they are doing. They are walking like that. They, they, they just. Uh, they, they don't know what they are doing. In other words, the nations have now been bewitched by her, and they are now. It's called out of control. Not in control of themselves. And yes, if Babylon represents the fallen systems of this world and the idolatry especially, because Babylon was known for idol worship. If it represents idolatry, then that is true. Because if you look all over the world, you see temples and temples and the way they are all maddened in it. They are just out of control. They are lost in there. They don't think about Jesus. And in there are millions and millions in every country. And they are becoming more popular. If you look at the statistics, they are the fastest growing religions. Did you now understand? Are you beginning to understand a little bit? Meaning, they are out of control. They are not in control of themselves. They are now being controlled by that wine. By her bewitchment. So they are now doing things that they ought not to do. They are now going to rivers and fetching witch sand and eating and putting on their, marking the faces. What they are, And they are worshipping in large numbers. They can meet in millions worshipping what? You know? Did you understand what's going on here? The three angels are coming to the earth with the message of the Lord Yahweh. They have been sent with the message of Yahweh. And if you listen to the content of that message, it shocks you. Then you're like, we have not yet preached it. The eternal gospel has not yet been preached. It has all the cautions and the warnings and the red flags. Hi. So the second angel is flying by and saying the nations, all of them have bought into idolatry. That the enemy has lied to them and they have entered idol worship. And yet, it is, yes, it is true because if you look at a section of the church, more than 90% of the church are caught up in it, maybe 99. They are also in idol worship. The church has become a place now when the Christians come. When the Christians come in, it's, uh, oh, I, I call it the consumer economy, the consumer salvation. Whereby, when they come, the pastor, he knows what they are looking for. He, he, prepare, he must give them what they are looking for. If it's a quick lunch or something, he just does for the business class, something small like this, and then say, bless you, he's going to bless your meeting now. So he sit so that the interview may go well. So they quickly gather that offering here, and then he just walks out and says, wow, I've finished now, I'm ready for the interview. Whatever. Did you understand me now? That idolatry has entered into the church, into the iglesia, at the center, in the inner chambers of the church. Whereby now people go to church, what can I get from God today? They never worship the Lord anymore for just who He is. They are not honoring him and worshipping him for just who he is. That he is worthy of honor, worthy of worship, worthy of glory. Not at all. They are coming to see what they can squeeze from his hands. On a daily basis. Aye. 
Is somebody with me or not at all? You are beginning to understand this. It's called the consumer gospel or whatever it is. Whereby they, they, you give them what they want, they also come to take what they want. You say, uh, Pastor, I need you to bless me. Yeah, because I'm going for this and that and I need your blessings. What? But how about holiness? How about Jesus? How about your eternity? Why not asking the most important questions? Your eternity. It's a quick worship service like this to gather some funds, the pastor to collect something small and to say a good seed or to bring somebody who is a good fundraiser who can say something and say it's a good ground for you to sow what? And then they can plant some few people to walk in there and just put one million shilling in the basket to, to stimulate people and uh, uh, and do things there. After that, the lunch hour session is over and the pastor now goes there walking in the city going to have his lunch. He's sold by cash. He sold it by cash. That is what the church has become. Nobody ever preaches repentance. Nobody cares for the sheep enough to care for their eternity. To tell them, please change your ways. The kingdom of God is near. Do you understand, Babylon? So that is going to be such an enormous uh, uh, sermon, an enormous message on its own accord, on its own merit. I'm simply walking through them as we cascade downwards, right? Hallelujah. And he goes on to say, and then we'll also wonder, what are her adulteries? What are her fornications? What is the maddening wine? And what is her adulteries and her fornications? That we'll love to know. Because God has now sent us help. And he wants the gospel to be restored back. Put it back in other words. Right? Hallelujah. 